we all know the Fed's bias to, to easing and they're going to find a way in the data to ease this year. Maybe it's not three, maybe it's not two, maybe it's only one. But what the real thing kicker is the tightening of financial conditions via the long end of the curve and the market basically tightening conditions in replace of, of the Fed and, and the Treasury. And that's what impacts you know asset markets the most. I think that's the biggest thing to watch in the commodities you know, spike and, and other inflation proxies is what's pressuring that right now. Hey, everyone. I want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian in crypto and provider of prime services. They're also one of my favorite companies in the space. So thank you very much to Copper for making this episode possible. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Kinto, the safety first L2, accelerating the transition to an on-chain financial system. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the episode. But for now, on with the program. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Guys Emporium. <laughs> the new title. I, you think I'm joking, Tyler? I'm getting us shirts. I'm getting us shirts for this. Yeah, put them on Blockworks website. There, there was a guy who wanted one in the comments last. Uh, yeah, episode. that's just what we need for our crypto and macro industry podcast. The show that says Guys Emporium. <laughs> that's, yeah. the, the gender balance wasn't strong enough. All right, Quinn and Tyler here, fellas. How are we doing? How's the week treating everyone? Great. Some action. Some action all week. Bitcoin to start Quinn, us off. Macro after. Most action. Quinn, we got a while. We we got to start off though by by giving you some props here. Just launched uh, Lecker Capital, my man. Congratulations. How's it feel? Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah, we got the got the word out and uh, pushing hard to wrap up fundraising over the next couple of weeks, and we'll be live in live in May. So exciting times. Really, you right. know, it's been in the works for a little bit and ready to get going. We're pumped for you, buddy. This is going to be, uh, just remember us when you're the next uh, Paul Tudor Jones and your Market Wizards interview uh, years from now. Be like, I started on this podcast. <laughs> I'll never uh, leave this podcast. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I was going back and so uh, Spotify now has audiobooks and they have a bunch of them for free that they're just promoting and they have Market Wizards. And I was going back, I was like, I've, I've read Market Wizards a couple times mm -hmm. over the years, and I was going back and listening to some of the interviews. If you go back and listen to the Paul Tudor Jones one, it's just funny, man. You know, we're, we talk on this podcast all the time about, you know, end of empire, deficits, dollar, et cetera. They were talking about this shit in 1989, <laughs> like, like it was going to be tomorrow. Like at the time of the recording, Paul Tudor Jones was concerned with like an imminent uh, economic catastrophe that he might be made a scapegoat of. It's just funny. Uh, it's just funny. So that was almost 40 years ago. So. Time's a flat circle. Yeah. You know what's incredible? As I found like Druckenmiller and, and Paul Tudor Jones, they have this like draconian macro backdrop, which I think allows them to see reality a little bit more clearly. But they always are you know, bullishly positioned. Like Druckenmiller has you know, an NVIDIA position that's in crazy that came out last week. And Yet he talks about you know how bad the finances are for the government, so I, I find that pretty fascinating. That juxtaposition there, I think it's also a different skill set between being an analyst and being a great trader or investor. You know, it's not the same thing. I think some of the biggest brainiacs, like the people that have the most intellectual horsepower, I I, I heard Greg Foss use this expression a couple of years ago: "Too clever by half." You know, and they mm -hmm. they get everything right, they do all the analysis, but then they just overthink it. Whereas I feel like some of the best investors or traders that I've ever met, just like, don't think too hard about it and just pull the trigger. Just don't mid curve it. You know, do you want to do a little bit of a victory lap with last week's call title on oil and the momentum trade? Yeah. I mean, for every one you get right, you probably get wrong, but this one was pretty obvious to me where everyone was piled into the momentum trade. You know, this, the ratio between oil and uh, stocks was, was rising and no one really was paying attention. And then, you have this tinderbox and geopolitics that just lit it off and kind of causing an unwind in a lot of the, the high beta tech momentum trades. So that happened. But at the same time, you know, this market's pretty powerful and the fangs are rallying today uh, back almost, you know, Meta's even like breaking out, Amazon's breaking out. So it's a pretty powerful market, even in the face of that. Yeah, I yeah. think it's interesting yesterday. I mean, we started the week, maybe I guess it was the the holdover from Friday's uh, PC, PC when, when the market was closed and there's a little 
damage done with the rising rates and uh, sell off and, and bonds. But things still like equities are very supported, like bouncing off that 20 day yesterday pierced through on the on the geopolitical stuff, but it looks to be bouncing again. It seems like under the surface, things are really starting to change and there's probably bigger moves in the months ahead, but mm. rally could probably continue a couple, another week or two. Do you guys think, so I've seen a lot of people talking recently about these rate cut expectations and the market repriced from six this year to three. And there's still some debate about whether or not we're going to get three or if it's going to be pushed out when it's going to happen. Obviously the election is still, is a probably realistically a pretty big factor in whether or not like whatever we end up getting with rate cuts. Does that end up moving the market at all? It increasingly feels like that's less and less of a factor in terms of what's driving like equities, gold, crypto. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, you go, Quinn. Well, I've been saying for a while, like, I mean, people who don't know the stuff as intricately it conflate yields and bond yields with the Fed funds rate. And like, if you don't understand the difference between the Fed funds rate and the 30 year, or the 10 year treasury bond, like, that's something that should be studied, you know, just pretty tremendously because there's a huge difference. And one is the rate set by, you know, six guys in a room in Washington. And the other is the one set by trillions of dollars in, in transactions and asset flows. So ultimately, I've had the view that the Fed, we all know the Fed's bias to, to easing and they're going to find a way in the data to ease this year. Maybe it's not three, maybe it's not two, maybe it's only one. And maybe it's zero at the end of the day if the, if, if the data stays as hot as it is. But what the real thing kicker is the tightening of financial conditions via the long end of the curve and the market basically tightening conditions in replace of, of the Fed and, and the Treasury. And that's what impacts you know asset markets the most. You look at like TLT as the instrument that um, the, the 20 plus year duration Treasury bond. So um, yeah, I think I think that's the biggest thing to watch in the commodities, you know, spike and and other inflation proxies is what's pressuring that right now. And one question that I mean, I'd be curious to get both of you guys' perspective here. Like we talked a little bit um, actually after we ended last week's show, but the correlation between some of these different assets. So, I mean, I know we, I know it feels like both of you guys are relatively bullish on stocks from here, um, but also gold and and Bitcoin. I'd be curious. Like this is something that people talk quite a bit about: is this correlation between Nasdaq and Bitcoin? Um, I know Quinn, you had some thoughts on that. I don't know if I want to just you know, poke you on how you kind of like measure that correlation and what it ultimately ends up telling you. Yeah. Tyler and I were talking about this last week. I think the Bitcoin and, and, um, trades off, off at times it's a currency debasement, you know, fiat hedge more like gold. And then at times it's a speculative tech asset that, that trades like a, an arc stock. And really the start of this year has all been the latter. It's been trading with, with tech and AI and, and the craze there. But in this last, and gold didn't really participate in that. In the last couple of weeks, we've seen gold really start to take off and actually BTC lag and, and not participate in the, the gold rally, um, even though you know people everybody comes at it from a different angle. I think t what Tyler and I agree on and is, is the ultimate goal for, for Bitcoin is if it starts trading more like that, that yeah, the ultimate goal for Bitcoin, I don't know if I said gold, was, is that it tr starts trading like gold and more of a, a fiat debasement hedge. Because in this environment where you get uh, interest rate repression from the central bank for whatever to, to ease uh, interest burden for the government debt, you know, calm the markets. Like even things like yesterday is good for risk assets where there's a sharp drop and there's the flight to safety for bonds. The yields fell. Uh, and and that could be a reason why Bitcoin was up because it just means these all these things are inflationary. Oil was spiking, but yields fell. It doesn't really make sense, but people are seeing that the end goal in all this is the Fed and, and Treasury working together to keep rates lower for you know suppressed as as long as possible to not negatively affect the, how the markets trade. And I think that's what kind of you know over time Bitcoin will trade like. It doesn't trade like that now, but that that to me is the 
the optimal case. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian and provider of prime services within digital assets. Today, what I want to talk to you specifically about is Clearloop. Clearloop is a solution from Copper, which to me solves one of the biggest problems for market makers, high frequency traders, hedge funds within digital assets. You know the exquisite pain of what I call the pre-funding problem. So if you want to take advantage of arbitrages that pop up across different exchanges, or you just have a tra trading strategy which requires you to be active on multiple different centralized exchanges, you have to pre-fund your account at each one of those exchanges. Now, this is not ideal for a whole bunch of reasons. One, you have to take counterparty risk from those exchanges, which as we saw this last year can have major consequences. Two, it's capital inefficient. You have a whole bunch of assets spread out there. Most of them are not doing anything most of the time. And three, it's just not great from a workflow standpoint and it creates administrative overhead. So enter Clearloop. Clearloop is the secure MPC custody solution provided by Copper. The way that it works is you deposit your assets into this MPC solution, which is owned and, owned and operated by you. Clearloop syncs up with a whole bunch of your favorite exchanges and then you can trade securely from Clearloop itself while not taking any counterparty exchange risk with any of these exchanges. And it's a super easy and nice UX. Now, Clearloop is trusted by the likes of Flow Traders, Brevin Howard, Nickel, some of the best in the business. But the coup de gras is in the extreme edge case that one of these exchanges were to go bankrupt, they have a very clever trust structure which segregates your assets and keeps you completely protected. So. Click the link at the bottom of this episode, especially if you're a hedge fund and market maker and you want to learn more or better yet, Dimitri, the CEO is actually going to be in person on a panel hosted by yours truly at Digital Asset Summit. So DAS London, that's March 18th to the 20th in London. So you should definitely click the link at the bottom of this episode, give your boy some credit, but also even better, come to DAS London and hear from Dimitri himself. All right. Cheers, everyone. Hey, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Kinto, the safety first layer two that is accelerating the transition to the on-chain financial system. Now, I know we're all very excited about tokenization. Larry Fink certainly is. He's on CNBC talking about it all the time. And I know we're all very excited about L2s. Here's the problem, though. If we want L2s to onboard the financial system, there's a lot of stuff that we still need. And Kinto is basically rolling out solutions for that. So one, it features user-owned KYC which is just table stakes for our regulated friends. And if we want the institutional capital to come in, Kinto offers a really good solution for that. They also have native account abstraction that solves some of the largest problems with onboarding in terms of security and user experience today, which is still very confusing. So if we want to bring more folks onto Ethereum, Kinto is the way to do that. And if you believe in this on-chain financial system and you actually want to get more active in Kinto and become a founding member, you should join their launch program, which is Engin. That's E-N-G-N. -N. You can see a link in the show notes. So if you're a part of that, you can do things like participate in Kinto governance, the launch ceremony, you can priority access to product launches on Kinto. You get reduced fees and unique discounts on products launch on Kinto. So overall, if you want to be a part of Kinto and the mission that they have, I would go click the link join the engine program and uh, thank me later. Uh, I've got a high level sort of framework to try out on you guys and, and see if this resonates, which is maybe this explains some of the schizophrenic trading that uh, like Quinn, you mentioned that sometimes Bitcoin trades a little bit like store value sort of hedge like gold and sometimes it trades like the NASDAQ. Like one explanation that would maybe explain how Bitcoin and gold have traded over the last you know five or six years, or I guess like since post COVID really, um, is if you look at Bitcoin and crypto writ large as like a liquidity sponge type of thing. So imagine this like big bucket of water and you're kind of sloshing it around and whenever some of that falls out, um, like Bitcoin ends up sopping it up. And the reason the reason maybe gold hasn't been hasn't performed super well is it's more like people are more looking at that myopically through the lens of uh, the inverse correlation to real rates and bonds have done like super well for the last couple of years and only recently have they done poorly and that's why gold has done relatively well recently. Um, whereas I feel like Bitcoin, I don't know, is maybe maybe trades a little bit more based on this like liquidity sponge type dynamic. What do you think about that? And I think that's what the NASDAQ, that's basically what's happening with tech stocks as well. Like, I mean, valuations are more like, quote, historically in line, but they're still completely nuts for private markets, for tech in general. We're just accepting a lot of this stuff like i hear people talk about nvidia all the time and i'm sure it's a great company i'm sure there's going to be a lot of compute that needs to get built out sam altman just gave this speech where i don't know if you guys heard this where he compared he did a, he did a very 
Uh, I was listening to Bill Gurley describe this as like Jobsian uh, sort of market sizing where he, you know, compared it to uh, the market for smartphones, but then shit all over the smartphone market for being too small compared to his market. And so, but I don't know, but at the same thing, uh, NVIDIA is still trading at like 40 times sales, which is, I, I just really tough to wrap your arms around. So for me, it's just, it's just this kind of liquidity sponge thing that explains it. I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, I agree with the liquidity sponge thing in general. Uh, you know, if you look at the Mike Howell work, it's absolutely nailed it. Even heading into this April tax day, he said there's going to be a pullback in liquidity. Uh, you know, watch the the TGA go up, and you know, tax sellers will come in. People are probably selling assets, selling crypto to finance their capital gains, etc. And and that's this little pocket here in in a buyback blackout. I think longer term, though, there's going to be a moment for Bitcoin where treasury yields go up. There's a, some sort of stagflationary or st- inflationary event. And people who own treasuries in super size, like sovereigns, start asking themselves, oh, my God, this is not the collateral I thought it was. And where do I put my money in You know, a deglobalizing sovereign reserve asset world. And yesterday was kind of interesting because we got a headline that Blinken was basically saying, you know, the US, I mean, Ukraine's going to go into NATO. And on that headline, uh, a lot of things, markets started selling off, but Bitcoin started rallying, which was kind of interesting. And so I don't know if that was, it was temporary, like a short squeeze in Bitcoin or, or not. But the fact that when that that's kind of like signaling to Putin, hey, Ukraine's in NATO. This could be a bigger conflict, bigger global issue. At the same time, Biden was uh, kind of saying to Netanyahu, "You got to calm things down over here." And Bitcoin rose. So, like, was that sort of a signal of this moment where it becomes a store of value like gold? It becomes it crosses over from the chasm from being a liquidity proxy to this you know, super decentralized store of value. I think we're probably on the cusp of something like that in these next couple of months. But it was I thought that was a really interesting thing just temporarily. It's you know, one one event doesn't make a, a trend, but let's let's keep an eye on that. Yeah, I think yeah, I agree with that. How I think about it is this tech this tech boom, all this stuff is fueled by cheap cost of capital. And, and no inflation, meaning it's all kind of one trade. If if the cost of energy and commodities and power is cheap and there's no inflation, you have, uh, you know, you can do all these sort of innovative speculative technologies that don't need to produce cash flows for 10 years. But if inflation is higher, the cost of capital is higher, those, you know, those DCF analysis don't work as much. And if, if this situation continues, you know, as... It, uh, maybe even a second wave of inflation would be like the you know the the maximum I guess you would call it whether that's four or five or eight percent who knows um, tech has to, like that inflation will cause rates to rise and and reprice tech assets lower again but in that case we've already seen the government suppress yield it's like five percent was kind of that soft line in the sand in October where things started to get out of whack. And in that situation, that's where this release valve of Bitcoin comes in, where you might have tech not performing that well because inflationary assets, oil, commodities are moving up, and that's repricing cost of capital and and asset allocation across the two industries. But in that case where the Bitcoin really wins is if it does well while tech does poorly, because that says right there, okay, People are moving to this in a time of of stress, unknown. When also in that time, they might be moving out of U.S. tech assets. You know, if we've seen, you know, everyone talks about the U.S.'s confiscation of of Russia's gold and the geopolitical flare ups with China and things like this, and the the lack of trust and declining usage of the dollar and trade. Um, these are all things that <clears throat> over time should be net negative for dollar based assets we've seen it in treasuries already because they're inflating supply every every year by 10 or 15% but we haven't seen that yet in the blue chip tech assets and it feels like a lot of the the capital is hiding out there 
if AI continues to to be ripping, you know, that that can continue longer. But at some point, you know, maybe over a multi-year horizon, it doesn't bode well for those assets and Bitcoin should perform well in spite of that. You know what I think the other phenomenon is, and I, I agree with that, is the FT just put out a great article today and it said global equity supply turns most negative since 1999. And, you know, we've been talking about this past couple of years, Mike, but like there's too much capital and not enough ideas. And so the, the market's shrinking. And when you think about the mechanism, you know, I did an interview years ago, this guy, Brian Reynolds, and he's essentially like pensions buy debt, that debt gets refunneled into buybacks that shrinks the market overall. And this, this has really been the engine of this market rally this entire time. And, it's it's actually getting worse. If you look at this chart from the FT, the net share interest globally is uh, dropping. You want to share your screen? Uh, share your screen? I, I actually can't because I'm on a different computer, but I will all right, all right. We'll get you the chart on this. Um, and then at the same time as this is shrinking, you have money market assets at all time high. So like, I think the phenomenon is just like, the more you put money in like debt instruments, the more it, it shrinks the equity market because the demographics are rolling over and that keeps tech because tech is the the market cap leader and there's our market cap weighted indices that just keeps it afloat until you have like an event or you have like this Apple lawsuit or antitrust type things that Andreessen and Horowitz are going after. They, there needs to be something that breaks this hegemon, like this big tech thing. What I have a very hard time, and I mean, this is like a horse that's been beaten to death by everyone because bonds have had their worst like multi-year performance in, in recent history in many, many decades. But how do you make, if you had to make the bull case for long duration treasury bonds, what what would it be? Because we're sitting, let's say on the 10 year at three, three or the 30 year at three, five or four, five, four, three, four, five. Um, you have the U.S. government printing, like increasing the supply of these treasuries like 10 to 20% annually based on the last couple of years. So like anything, if you increase supply and demand doesn't grow, price has to fall to compensate. You have the other dynamics of like the world becoming more multipolar, you know, instead of just unipolar U.S. led. But like, what's the bull case for these bonds. It's like a recession where inflation comes down to 1% and it makes, you know, a couple hundred bips. But even in that case, then they print more and the growth rate of treasury supply is not 20%, it's 30%. Like, I just don't see any reversal in this trend of the last few years and the market seems to be responding to that. I think you get mandated buying. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that's the bull case that, yeah. They're simply too important. They're they're the ultimate too big to fail. And there are I, I do think that people tend to underestimate the levers that these policymakers have available to them. They can just mandate that they can create what's it called that framework for that risk framework. The for SLR banks. where they reduce the leverage ratio and basically it's instead of the Fed buying the bonds, the Fed's making the banks in the private right. sector buy the bonds. Exactly. That's the bull case, I think. Yeah. It, it's just not a great concoction though for any, like if, if you're, it, that might temporarily support markets, but you have to imagine over time, smart allocators around the world start to pick up on the fact that that needs to be done to support an asset market or a financial system as well, look at, look at a negative indictment. Look at Japan. Yeah. And he did it for 20 years. 30? I don't know. What's, what's the actual, exact time? Yeah, it was like 90 to ninety to now. like 30 and, I, years. and I guess their equity market got annihilated, but we're a more globalized capital market, deeper capital market. It would be it would be hard. Yeah. You know what's funny about Japan is that they're slowly starting to reverse or walk back that policy, and no one really seems to care. I think it was Felix that pointed this out. It was like, you know... Rates have been negative over there for so long. The debt is so high. And this was supposed to be this extremely delicate balance where if it ever went into even slightly positive territory, that was going to unwind this whole thing. But people are excited about Japan for the first time in a while. I mean, it's not, it doesn't look like it's going to seriously break anything. It broke out know. through, uh, was it 40,000 on the Nikkei? And mm-hmm. 
the wages are going up there. It's it. In fact, I think the valuations, the book values, a lot of those companies, the exporters are trading dirt cheap. Like Buffett bought them years ago. Probably saw this coming. Um, Dude, that guy. How he deployed <laughs> billions into this trade, and it's up multiples. I mean, well, he's just insane. He, he looks at the vol of everything. I mean, he, he's a he's a volatility seller, and so I think at the time it was like you know pretty much washed out. And he's got a wink, wink with all the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the guy's done well, though. Come on. Oh yeah, no, no, I, I totally agree. I just it it seems so prescient, but he's got a system. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you know, I don't know. It's it's hard to know how this whole thing ends up. But I I do feel like honestly, Tyler, this goes back to your big thing of the capital versus labor. It just feels like. Basically, it feels like everyone's going to have to start paying people more, right? At the end of the day, like it's, I mean, the ultimate goal of what we're talking about here is just how do you organize society? Like that, that, that is the goal that these people care about. Like, how do we get everyone rolling in the right direction? At a, at a certain very high level, all this stuff is just kind of frameworks. And I don't know, it feels like the end game that's, that's going to happen here. I don't really know. It's probably going to take another 40 years to play out, but it just probably feels like bondholders generally do slightly less well. The government leans on, you know, large banks to buy those bonds. Uh, there are like slowly losses accumulated and taken over time. And then there's like strong GDP and wage growth. And there's just this like big rebalancing. I don't know. I, I sort of started to believe that there isn't going to be this, this crazy uh, depression type thing that people are calling. It just doesn't feel like that's what's going to happen here. No, but there are that, yeah. weird social challenges. I, I think this leads to the weird social challenge factor. Uh, and and you see these like populist figures that pop up around these like transitional moments in history, and they can either be really good or they could be really bad, and it's just impossible to predict that. That's just like you flip a coin, and hopefully they're good. We policymakers like implicitly, oh, well, explicitly by actions, but implicitly have eliminated the option of having a recession in this country. We haven't had a recession. I mean, COVID wasn't a recession. I mean, it was, but we were printing stimulus helicopter money and unemployed people in the country were getting paid more than when they were working. We, we, that's not a recession. You know, you have to go back um, over 15 years to the great, to 08, 09 for the most recent recession this country's had. And we got a slowdown, a technical recession in 2022 and the government stepped in and it was like almost, it was barely negative growth. So it, implicitly, they've, it's off limits. Like politically, it is off limits today to have any sort of quote unquote recession. And I think they will continue that path. Like even a Trump or a Biden are going to continue that path. But what it does is it, it just screws everyone over on a real basis. Nominally, they can make prices go up forever because you just deflate. Uh, but real, you you have to be you have to be as a as an investor in a you know how are you allocating your money you know shrewd about about where you're putting it because that's ultimately where these tech assets and and things that have done so well will will get hurt because now that we talk about that bank um, the Calorcus guy or whatever I'm probably mispronouncing his name he wrote that great paper about what what the government could do if if uh, they really wanted to stop inflation and that would be to stop paying interest on excess reserves held by the banking system at the fed but by making the 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 banks take down uh treasuries and replace the fed which would be optically a lot easier to do than say we're doing a big qe policy again when inflation is still high that's the point where it really crowds out private sector lending and and credit creation for small and medium and large sized businesses in the US, that is when I could see this kind of relation between liquidity being so good for, you know, NVIDIA and, and tech stocks, that would be a turning point where I would start to kind of get a little, you know, like, okay, this is actually going to crowd out, uh, you know, some of this funding and, and, and lending growth. Yeah, I think, I think there's going to be some, like, some tectonic shift politically where you have to incentivize smaller business and innovation because 
that's not where, where it happens in big businesses. And that rotation should naturally happen as the power structures, you know, change. Like you can see all the big tech incentives being orthogonal to your everyday person and labor's growing power. Like labor is clearly growing power globally and they're just going to vote it out eventually. It's just taking a long, long time. Mm. The, you know what, uh, Quinn, something that you were saying a little, a couple minutes ago about, um, like who gets, if, if you get screwed up. Is that the earthquake? Sorry, there, was, there was an earthquake in New York. <laughs> did you, did anyone else feel that? Quinn, did you also feel it on the East Coast or Tyler? No. Did you feel it in- no, it's not in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I've never felt, that's crazy. I've never felt an earthquake before, but, uh, we don't get natural but, disasters down here. We're in Florida. We're immune. Yeah. Give it, <laughs> no, yeah. Hurricanes. <laughs> no hurricanes or anything. Yeah, exactly. There's um, no global warming in, in Florida. I've, I've never, I've never even felt an earthquake before. And it didn't occur to me that that would be, I, I thought it was just like, man, these construction crews are going nuts outside of my apartment. They're shaking the whole building. <laughs> and then I was like, oh no, this, that's New York. This is, <laughs> this is something else. Yeah. yeah. Um, Damn, what if you were building up on like a 50 story skyscraper and that hits? Oof. You know what is, you know, it's one of the most mind blowing photos to me of all. I don't know if you guys are afraid of heights, but you know, those like old 1930s type construction photos. I don't know. Whenever they were building the Empire State Building, they're just those guys like eating their bag lunches. I'm like, we're so dangling. My well, first apartment like, in New York. God, we're I so had soft. So huge. So soft. I, had, huge. So soft. I yeah. had that picture huge on the wall, like a massive uh, print of that picture on my wall. Like it's so, it's so cool. I mean, those guys, like you want to complain about something, like you want to, you're having a bad day or like you don't want to go to work and sit in your, like these guys are actually putting their life <laughs> like on the line every day just to like build the best city in the world. I mean, it's like so inspiring that picture. I love it. We need to reinstall yeah. that in America because, like, yeah. I would actually argue those guys were probably happier than this generation. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. That's and, the ultimate irony. Yeah. It's like the expectation. It's, it's like, what is it? Happiness equals expectation, expectation minus reality or something. I will say our generation's expectations are nuts in terms of, in terms of the output they think they should get versus the input that is needed to go into that is crazy. Um, well, you know what? to bring it all around is like once the next generation gets to politically in power, it's just going to be massively inflationary, bail out student loans, bail out this, bail out that. And the truth is like, they just learned that it worked for a while and then it becomes really inflationary. And that's where, you know, you get super labor, you know, unions are going to get a lot of power. I want to do, I would do want to talk about the Angus Deaton paper and Yellen at some point, I don't know. All right. So wait, before we get to that, just th- there was a, so I was, I was listening to this, this, uh, documentary about 1974, uh, UK. And this was Harold Wilson was the prime minister. This was before Margaret Thatcher came in and she broke the back of the unions, but the unions actually had a, a role to play in inflation that was going on in the UK back then. And there were these extremely powerful trade unions, like, you know, teachers union. I think there was, there was also like the whaling type and the, you know, different types of industries back then. But basically what these, these union leaders would do because there were these horrible strikes and it was brutal for the government, uh, cause they had this weird stagflationary thing going on back then is they would go in and they would negotiate for their workers pay and they were getting 25, 30%, uh, hikes year over year to pay to, you know, compensate for inflation. Obviously that just makes inflation worse, but you know, we we tend to, there are all these arguments. I've had many of them over the years. Is inflation, who does it really hurt? Does it hurt the poor? Does it hurt the the middle class? Does it yada, yada? And it's really, I mean, Lynn Alden gave a great definition of this years ago. It hurts uh, creditors, people that have extended debt because their income is essentially getting inflated away. But it also is really differential based on like where you, what industry you work in. It is, it's kind of a myth, I think, that it impacts. Like if you're a knowledge worker working in tech, you know, complaining about your life and wages. Like, I got news for you, brother. <laughs> it, is, it is about the best that it could possibly be. Like, you are not the affected party here. You know, my girlfriend is a teacher. I, she gets rocked, rocked mm-hmm. with it. Like, that teachers are the affected party. Nurses, you yeah. know, not if you're working in like a high powered knowledge job, like, you are not the victim 
of this situation. I have so a it's, not as, it's not as uniform, you know, as your income demographic and stuff like that. Yeah. I have a great rule of thumb for this. And mm. this is, I lived in San Francisco for five years. And my rule of thumb is if, if the chief of police or chief of the fire department cannot live in that town, there's something seriously wrong or like a principal at a school or all these, you know, that's a real sign that you need to change like politics somehow, whether it be increased housing supply or whatever. I like that. that. It's a real sign that like your social contract is breaking and something needs to be done. Like there's a principle like Georgism where like once, you know, all the economic value of an area starts going to all the, the landlords, then that's a sign that like you need to put a tax on the landlords or, or, you know, change prop 19 or whatever it is. Um, all these things, prop 19 was a tax where if you bought your house in 1970 in California, like you still were struck on a $5 million house at like $70,000. So like all these mm-hmm. sort of political things happen. And I think that's why teachers, the labor unions should have been arguing for higher pay in a lot of these, these cities to compensate for the, the cost of living there. Yeah. Dude, the teacher stuff is mind blowing. I, I honestly, I've been watching this up close and personal. It's been a revelation to me. You know, teachers have to pay to furnish their own classrooms. It's like, what? How, when? <laughs> in what scenario would that happen in corporate America? Never. You expense everything. I, I mean, they give them, they give them like two hundred bucks or something like that, but it costs on average like two thousand. Like, just close your eyes and picture an elementary school. Like, what is there? There's like bookshelves. There's little toys on the floor and stuff like that. All that the teachers buy, the schools don't buy them. How how insane is that? Yeah. Bananas. Should have buy pencils for our own classroom. Well, a lot, a lot of these things what? will probably probably change. I mean, if I yeah. if I was in that position and I I live that and then I see the money just flying everywhere, like externally outside the US, like we write in checks. <laughs> U.S. government writes checks like it's monopoly money to everybody, and then doesn't take. I mean, that that comes home to roost at some point. You know, you can't 100%. you can't neglect your internal people that hard for long. I mean, we're seeing it, right? Populism, Trump, etc. Mm-hmm. Right. Hello, hello, listeners of On The Margin. I've got good news for those of you who are in the crypto scene. BlockWorks is bringing back Permissionless. We're going to be doing Permissionless 3, and this year we are heading west. So we're moving that out to Salt Lake City. That's going to be October 9th through 11th this year. We've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers for you. So we've got Balaji headlining. We've got Sriram, Munib, Matt Hogan of Bitwise, Jan Van Eck. This one's going to be a blast, guys. And I saw many of you out in London for a DAS this year, and I hope to see you out in Salt Lake for permissionless. And because y'all are such faithful listeners, you've got if you use code margin 10, you're going to get 10% off your tickets. Appreciate you all. Hope to see you out there. Tell you want to talk about this yelling, this yelling paper? Well, yeah, you, you want to intro it and I, I got something to add to it. Yeah. So basically, I mean, the trend uh, for, I don't know, maybe like the overriding trend in geopolitics, uh, like international affairs, whatever, for the last, I don't know, would you guys say 40 years has been globalization. And there have been all these arguments. There actually was a time back in uh, like around the 90s um, that there was a, there was more robust debate around it, I would say. And there was a lot, there was a lot of academic, there were kind of, there were different sides and angles and approaches. People were generally really excited about it. But, you know, one of the things that, Tyler, you put me onto this credit to you, put me onto it, uh, was this great uh, interview with Sir James Goldsmith, who is this British industrialist, you know, very successful guy, uh, had a bunch of companies over in the UK. And he, there's this really famous Charlie Rose segment that he did. Uh, I think this was back in 1994, where he's arguing, you know, there's a, and there's actually a debate with someone from one of these three letter agencies about you know, if we induct China into the um, WTO, what would the impact of that be? And the prevailing narrative at the time, obviously, China did end up getting inducted. So there's probably just some element of like, hey, they're a large economy. This feels fair. But there was a there was kind of this there's this idea that hey, China actually is going to be a large market. Right now, they're mostly 
uh, manufacturers, but eventually they're going to turn into a, a market of buyers. And it's going to be net good for the United States as well, because we're going to export a whole bunch of goods to this market. In, in some senses, I guess it's important to point out that that is, that is kind of true, right? Like China is a massive market for Tesla, for Apple. Maybe that's why it's, it's both of those stocks are declining right now. But the argument that this guy, Sir James Goldsmith, made was that you are opening up your labor pool to just way, way cheaper uh, labor. And, and ultimately, what this is going to end up doing, the incentive, if you own a corporation and you employ uh, many employees over in the US or the UK or more industrialized type economies, uh, and you start to farm that out to this extremely low cost labor pool, you're just screwing your your own workers. It's going to be great for capital, right? Everyone's profits are going to go up, but it's going to be extremely damaging and hollow out these really critical sectors in local countries. Um, and there's uh, we can link we can link this whole. It's an hour long interview. You really only need to listen to minute six through twelve of this, where he presents this entire argument. It's great. It'll take you five minutes. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, that that was the minority sort of contrarian take back then, and I think it's proven out directly right. And so there's this paper that came out this week um, that is sort of starting to, I think for the first time, seriously question globalization and the value set there and how beneficial it is to different countries. And, you know, it comes from Janet Yellen, and she's a super important person um, in the United States. And I think symbolically, that's that's very important. I think one way that you could read this is that uh, the geopolitical tensions with China is just ratcheting up. So you could view this as like a China document, or you could view this as a mindset and regime type shift. But that would be the, maybe that was a little higher level context than you were looking for, Tyler, but like, that's the way that I would set. No, I love it. I mean, China basically has functioned like a cartel. Like when you think about how they, they go in, they subsidize this, these, their industries so that everybody else can't compete. They, they give you all these, these incentives, you know, if you are a overseas person and it, essentially they, they just corner the market. But this was a, this was a paper by this guy, Angus Deaton. He's a famous economist, won the Nobel prize. And he wrote this, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. This is a quote. I'm much more skeptical about the benefits of free trade to American workers and if even, even skeptical of the claim which I and others have made in the past, that globalization was responsible for the vast reduction in global poverty over the past 30 years. I also no longer defend the idea that the harm done to working Americans by globalization was a reasonable price to pay for global poverty reduction because workers in America are so much better off than the global poor. I, al I also believe that the reduction in poverty in India had little to do with the world trade. And poverty reduction in China could have happened with less damage to workers in rich countries if Chinese policies caused it to save less of its national income, allowing more of its manufacturing growth to be absorbed at home. I also had seriously underthought my ethical judgments about trade-offs between domestic and foreign workers. We certainly have a duty aid to aid those in distress, but we have additional obligations to our fellow citizens that we do not have to others. And like, this is a guy who, who pumped, I, I always say the heroes of this generation are the villains of the next. And I hate to say this, this guy is probably a nice guy, but he pumped globalization for years. And now at the end of his career, after 50 years, is like, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> we created all these policies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and, and so this is like the epitome of like the boomer uh, leadership system that I think millennials, Gen Z or Gen X are like, man, this is a tough pill to swallow. Like, sorry, you annihilated a whole bunch of people, gave them a whole opioid crisis. My bad. It's, I think the uh, are kind of you know they're trying to find a balance now because you can't just rip the bandaid off causes world war and and so they got to come to the table the vault controllers got to stifle it and figure out some trade deals and create a more balanced ecosystem but we'll see if it happens it could you know if, if oil spikes here then it's a sign that the geopolitics might be worse than we think yeah that's that's the thing is like it's easy to sm sound smart if everything's in there. There's so many things affecting these, these decisions and variables that are out of your hands. But when things are going your direction or the trend is in your favor, you assign, you know, you assign more probability to you being right and less probability to like the circumstances being conducive to, to that. Like all this 
globalization stuff is fine until the geopolitical realities like worsen at home and domestically and, and you have problems or like you point out, Tyler, commodities become expensive inflation. Like the dollar, the, the U S has been so privileged with the strength of the dollar. Like the rest of the world had such a worse inflation bout than, than us because unlike normal times where the dollar and oil are inversely correlated because we've been a huge producer, uh, in 21, 22, 23, oil was going up at that time and, and the dollar was going up as well and, and insulating that. But, but these real, you know, the, the niceties of having that privilege will change these policymakers and people's, uh, ability to maneuver, you know, through these periods. Mike, you're on mute. All right. There's a great, there's a great, I was looking for this paper. I'll see if I can find it to get for the show notes, but there's a great piece that I read a long time ago that basically informed my entire worldview around this, which is, have you ever heard of a resource curse? Are you familiar with that concept? Is this like Saudi Arabia's, you know, uh, in- yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yes. So this is, this is basically the idea that let's say there's a country, a Dutch disease is, is another way of, another way of describing it. And it was, it was originally called Dutch disease because in Holland, they discovered these enormous, uh, you know, oil wells, right? So they found all this oil, really rich natural resource. You'd say, Hey, that's really great for the, for the Dutch, right? Overall, it's an economy. And it turned out it's actually not because what ends up the dynamic that ends up happening is there's a small industry that rises up around actually harvesting and then exporting that natural resource. It makes that one small group incredibly wealthy, but then it drives up the cost of the dollar or the like the whatever the natural currency is, makes the rest of the exports extremely uncompetitive, and it ends up enriching one small group and impoverishing basically the rest of the society. And there have been a number, there have been a number of Niall Ferguson talks about it in the ascent of money. The the money could be gold. So they actually brought up the example, I can't remember if it was Spain or Portugal, but they found all this silver. It actually had the same effect. Um, and you see it in like a bunch of modern, like Middle Eastern type nations, right? Where that's the case. It's like this ruling group, they control basically oil, and then the rest of the country is sort of impoverished and dependent on that. And uh, this this article compared the commodity that the United States has that they export as dollars. <laughs> and basically, there's this extremely small group uh, that has benefited from exporting our national commodity, which is dollars, abroad. And it's done extremely well for that, essentially, the banking sector. But if you are an exporter in the US or you're in the manufacturing sector, your entire industry has been hollowed out. And that, you know, it's it's probably a little too high level to be like, so there's definitely way more nuance to it than that. But it sort of fits, doesn't it? I mean, that's a great I also love that framework. Yeah, it's it's a pretty good framework, I think, that explains a lot of what's going on. And it does. I like mean Luke, Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I was good. The last thing I was gonna say is I know um had uh Michael Cow on this program before talk about basically exactly this dynamic and the I you know to hear it from him, the uh the military is actually starting to be interested in this because they view our industrial base as a national defense imperative and they're like hey this shit's been hollowed out like we do not we cannot produce stuff mm -hmm. like we used to and they're actually starting to trace it to our monetary system and framework yeah groman's all over that i mean the, the yeah. analogy completely holds think about we're we're we dominate global trade so whatever it is 60 to 80 percent of global trade or is done in the dollar and imagine if the the dominant player of oil like Saudi Arabia or at, at different t parts of the, the world's history, like Latin American countries like Venezuela, or, you know, just said, okay, we export, you know, oil, we make 90% of our GDP from oil. That'd be a great idea if we just doubled the oil supply because we can then double our revenues and be a much wealthier country. And then there are 70% of the oil market, assuming, and they double oil supply and the price of oil plummets. Like the US has been doing this with dollars and the d price of dollars has not yet corrected. The tr price of treasuries is correcting because they're doing it through through treasury issuance now. But at some point that that does have to correct. Uh, and I think it's a perfect analogy. It's There's no free lunch. Like 
you can pull no. a lot of strings. Uh, and yeah. Well, there is a free lunch if you can push your labor supply, you know, your, your labor, that's basically what's happened is you've, you know, all the money has gone to capital and it's not going to labor when you dilute your fiat currency system globally. And I, I think that's just, that's reversing. That's what you're saying too, is potentially as labor has more power, the dollar kind of will roll yeah. over. And it'll take like another 20 years, like Mike said. So it's, it's hard to talk about these things. It'll it's tradable. Forever, but <laughs> forever, dude. I found it. I'll link this in the show notes. It's an article. There's a website called Phenomenal World. The title of this article is The Class Politics of the Dollar System. Shout out Yaakov Fagan and Dominic Luzder. <laughs> those names. We should have Tyler pronounce them. L E U S T E R. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how you take a crack at that, Tyler, but that was very influential. Tyler's my pronunciation guy. You know, you got a guy for everything. He's my pronunciation guy. Mubalala. Mubalala. <laughs> <laughs> um what do you guys think about uh maybe zooming 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 in uh to markets a little bit here like what do you guys think about bitcoin and crypto at large here it's kind of been it's been a couple of weeks of basically treading sideways what do you guys think i've well, uh go ahead tyler I was yeah first all right so one interesting thing is so btig just sent out a great report about bitcoin miners and they've basically mm. gone from selling their Bitcoin to hodling. And I thought that was kind of interesting. All their CapEx at the Bitcoin miners has been essentially funded. And now they're just holding on to their Bitcoin. And they were a lot of supply when they were trying to finance all these big CapEx plans to you know, create more ex, you know, hash, hash rate you know, in the future. So all those have been mostly financed. And now they're stopping selling their Bitcoin, which takes away a huge part of supply right before the halvening as well. I think if you get just the macro to be a little bit more copacetic here, Bitcoin should launch their new highs. Um, mm. Is my because supply and demand and like geopolitically, I think everything's lining up for someone to say, "I need you know an allocation here." You also have Morgan Stanley is rushing to to offer to their clients some Bitcoin. A lot of the RIAs are turning on slowly. So this this supply and demand Im imbalance is, I think, is getting worse, especially after the halvening. I, I, it's hard to sell here. The only reason you'd sell it really was if you see like a super spike in yields and a macro deleveraging. So I'm I'm very constructive on it here. Yeah, I think my base case going into this month was strength in the early part and weakness in the in the back. I thought the yield the the real problem with the spike in yields and commodities i i thought will come more end of april and in may it's we saw it the first first week obviously we've seen some of it and then we got hit with this geopolitical stuff which which made it worse but when i see bitcoin still just under 70 and the nasdaq now you know back above its 20 day moving average and, and pretty supported it tells me like things aren't going to get that worse for now. And so my, my base case, despite this, this, uh, period of weakness, this first week actually might hold in that we do see a, a rally back. We just had $2 billion about of, of GBTC of Bitcoin, uh, liquidated via GBTC from the, the Genesis, uh, Gemini stuff that looks to be done. You know, the last three days have been really low on GBTC flow outflows and we have the having in two weeks and I haven't seen one word of it in in recent you know last couple of weeks on on Twitter. So I actually think this move down caught a lot of people off guard. Leverage got really high. Yeah. People got overextended. Positioning was was too rich. I think this th that back to back days of like minus ten on Bitcoin, minus like twenty on alts. I think it really smoked some people. And you look, think, look on Twitter, all these big accounts have been quiet. You know, people people were off sides, and and the positioning is clear as day now. Like. Leverage is way down. Uh, the the futures, the funding is way down, and you have the flows, the outflows from the ETF slowing, and and IBIT and Fidelity, BlackRock Fidelity have just continued somehow funneling more flows into Bitcoin ETFs. So I am constructive for this period, particularly you know as equities and macro kind of calms, and uh, for a little kind of push higher here, and and then maybe maybe my base case still holds where where we get weakness later, but we'll have to evaluate then. Mm. 
One one other interesting thing macro wise that could affect all this is so Biden stopped buying oil to refill the SPR. And I I think, you know, if I'm making a prediction, another prediction is they'll probably start selling the SPR again eventually. You know, on the RSI's USO is oil's kind of getting a little bit overbought. The vol characteristics are a little bit more extreme. XLE is at an 83 RSI here. I think oil starts becoming a problem for the administration. They'll probably have to vol control it. Um, and, and another interesting trade that happened yesterday this is probably out there, but it's this was not not investment advice, but security. Uh, someone bought uh, 20,000 April 15 strike puts on the VIX and they sold 50,000 July 20 strike calls on the VIX and they took in $8.5 million on that trade. And, and that's pretty, pretty big trade. And I think they're expecting, you know, the administration has come in, smash vol in the near term. The VIX was almost inverted uh, from the one month to three mm-hmm. month. And you're selling July volatility. And July is n- normally the slowest month ever. Everyone's on vacation. Seasonally, you know, the VIX gets smushed there. So they took in $8 million bucks to basically buy downside and near-term VIX. I thought that was a, a just strategic trade at when all this stuff is happening in oil. I'm probably going down a crazy rabbit hole here. But the point is, is that I think we're at the point where the – the the politicians have to get get together and do something and kind of stifle the volatility. I I, I think that's going to happen over the next week, unless Israel and Ukraine really you know un, unwind here. So that's where I'm at. Hmm. I think there's even outside of the macro factors. Like again, I just think that this is very typical mid cycle crypto stuff like even the all time high break uh it i made maybe one thing that's like slightly different this time is that i do think for, for some reason it feels maybe this is just purely anecdotal to me but uh, i think there's a combination of one the the journey from all time high to all time high was not as long as it was last time it actually feels like there are more bag holders that didn't sell that are now being like like last time when Bitcoin is breaking through an all-time high, I didn't have anyone asking, like, is now the time to sell? Everyone was like either just coming back to it. But I think there's a lot of people now being like, okay, should I finally like sell my bag so I'm not underwater? I think that is a difference. And I think another difference is that there are, I mean, this is just overall, like the more institutional the 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 investor set gets for an asset, like the more I think vol dampening it's ultimately going to be. And I do think there's like a lot of call selling that's happening right now around these like around the like you can see that around the all-time high and i just think yeah this is probably maybe that's like mixing up a little bit but if you go back to look at november 2020 through jan 2021 it looked like it it kind of kissed the all-time high and then it sold off and so this is all just really typical stuff and there's there's a i'm sure like the macro explanation that you guys are giving but i also just i still think we're just in like really traditional crypto cycle mode here and i i also just think we're yeah three weeks out from the having and there's probably not much stuff to be really bearish about, but not financial advice. We we need yeah. somebody to come on here and tell us why we're all wrong. Yeah, that's a good point. We should get a contradictory. We should get a contradictory voice in the mix. Yeah. It would be it would be a good bear to come up with the steel man for why Bianco. He's a Peter Schiff. He's not a bear though. He's not. <laughs> I, I I don't know about that one, but I, Bianco's not a he's not a he's not a bear. I don't think right now. Um, who would be good? I don't know. Maybe we'll we'll, we'll come. If if someone out there is listening that knows like a very good account or person that has a great analytical framework for why this is the time to get bearish on Bitcoin and crypto, hit us hit us up and they can join the the guys yeah. emporium here. We can the comments. Chat. Yeah, <laughs> let's exactly. do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fellas. Let's let's roast Mike as much as we can in the comments. He got a new plant. Look at that thing. (laughs) Look at that thing. It's alive and well. This is a picture of life here. Yeah, look at that. Spring has sprung in New York City. 
Yes. Your hair, your hair looks great. Look at that. Everything's well, yeah, I, I saw the roast that you gave me on Twitter. I was like, all right, I guess I got to step my game up for the fellas here. <laughs> I don't want to get – I actually did. You know what's funny, though? On that on that particular episode, I looked at myself on the video. And I was like, oh, boy. Yeah, you could do better there, buddy. Tyler, but why do you, you never comment on my plant? It's it's a money tree. Oh, dude, what is that? Is that real? Is that looks Yeah, fine. it's a money tree. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. Is that an actual? This is uh, mm-hmm. what is this? Lily something something. Low. I you know you know what the problem is. This room doesn't get direct light. It gets indirect light. And I guess for Birds of Paradise, you just need the direct light. Otherwise, something's gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> Look Not at this. Get, <laughs> get your macro. Get your crypto. Get your get your get your plant plants. housekeeping. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the people were commenting on it for a while. They're like, hey, Mike, that plant looks like shit. <laughs> I'll, I'll do what I can. You know what? I really needed some artwork in the background here. Quinn, you could use a little bit of artwork as well. Tyler's Tyler's really holding down the fort. I have uh, my pudgy poster that's been ha- in a frame sitting on the floor for three weeks that uh, will get hung whenever I... I don't know if that... Is, we're not going it, 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 to... Maybe it counts when it gets on the wall, but a poster is... We're gonna give you half credit for that, I think, as a as well, initiative. Get you guys some art. I need a plant. Anyone who wants to subsidize me for a plant, I'm happy. I'll take it. Put it yeah. right here. Yeah. Well, you got You got to do your own research. You, it depends on the lighting, apparently, and and how good of a plant parent you are, Tyler. But um, yeah. you're keeping multiple ch- actual children alive, so we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. That this, this that is true. This alive. is true. My my four year old's turning. Well, my three year old's turning four tomorrow. So happy birthday! Wow. What are you doing to celebrate? Uh, just a pool party here. No, no biggie. Nice. nice, Tyler. Does it um, what in terms of the average like strain of parenting? Is it easier taking care of four year olds than one or two year olds, or is it roughly the same? They're all hard in different ways. Like I have, I have a five, four year old and a one year old, and mm. you know the baby doesn't sleep well. So that's why I got bags under my eyes. The five year old's kind of easy now because he's like you know, less of the emotional roller coaster type stuff. And like mm-hmm. four, four starts getting a little bit easier. But like three is where like you get this shot of testosterone. I have three boys and it's like you're, you're crazy and haywire and like large emotional swings. So that's oh, the point. Yeah. Dude, so Yano, Yano and his wife, Dana, uh, they had to babysit her. Dana's sister just had a baby. And they had to watch this baby for maybe 36 hours. And Yano looked like he just came back from war. <laughs> from war. He was like, he was texting me. He's like, dude, I don't know if I can do it. It's like, you've had this baby for like 10 hours, man. Like 10 <laughs> hours. It's like anything else. You, you build up a tolerance. He's like, they run around. You know, he's like, I tried to make eggs for myself. This this little kid ran out of the room. He was like, shit, did I just lose this kid? You know? And it, it yeah, I guess that maybe that worry leaves you after a while, but. You get that said, said the too. Like yeah. you can just, I can carry my one year old and do an entire grocery shopping in my it, like holding him. And I'm like, if before I was in great shape, but I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't hold anything. And now you have this weird, these weird dad strength. Now I'm, you know, pudgy and fat, and but I can hold my hold this thing for like, <laughs> you know, six hours. It's the weirdest, <laughs> weirdest. Strength. Okay, but Tyler, here's my thing though. With yeah. when when we were talking, when you were just having, I think it was Bo. Is yeah, the well, middle yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so so you know what it's like you you talk to all these new parents and they're like oh dude so tired you know i haven't slept in like three months blah 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 but it's the best thing ever it's like oh, it's is it oh, it's the best. <laughs> absolutely the best. you know what it's like though new parents like you know how when your buddy like is like hey this this smells really bad like go sniff this thing that's what you new parents are like yeah. You know, Here, here's the one thing. This is not to get too uh, philosophical here, but like you get stuff like this. Dad, you rock. What are those? It's just two rocks with some eyeballs on it. But like, oh, that's sick. I mean, but I'll say this as when you're a single guy, this is, no one talks about this. I always t- tell my friends or, or just a guy with no kids for like your 20s. People look at you like you're some like child molester. Right, and they don't really look at you, or you're just some predator. I mean, I mean this. I think, I think you're. I think you're projecting here a little. Tall. I've actually yeah, never. Yeah, really yeah, felt yeah. Like that. I don't know if right. people looked at right. you I'm like, bro. but they just, they just don't trust you as much. When you have a kid, people smile at you as a that's oh, true man. I see what they you mean. You completely differently. Like I can as, a, as a guy with a kid, like you are, like you're, you're back into the pool of humans. 
But like as a mid twenties, it's why guys are so depressed. It's like everyone treats you like crap, yeah. <laughs> and they automatically just like you know they, they count you off. Like they don't care. <laughs> but then well, after, see, see, like, after seeing oh, your birthday party group picture from yeah. Vegas, I mean, I see why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. By the way, maybe I'm, they didn't look that weekend. They were like, "That's that." It's not immediately obvious that you were a father that weekend. We can no. count you out there. I don't know if you saw a picture. I'm I'm six three, and like all my buddies played. You're six three. Yeah, and they're all those guys are they're Amazon like nine six ten, just monsters. So, <laughs> it's kind of funny. The picture made you look like you're like five eight. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, oh, Tyler's shorter than I thought. No, I, I play shit. basketball, and all the, all my buddies are huge. Oh, dude, these guys are well, massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so, I want to go be I with you guys when we get in fights. <laughs> no, we're, we're still soft like the rest of the millennials. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, fellas, feels like a good place to chop it. Yeah. See you next. Have week. a good weekend, guys. <laughs> <laughs>